So sometimes when you're researching a topic, uh, whether it's hotels, diets or bad fathers or anything else, it might be important to find out what kinds of constructs people use when they are um, thinking about those things. And so a personal construct method might be appropriate for you. So for the rest of the session then, I'm going to be introducing you to one particular method that has arisen from personal construct psychology. And this is called the repertory grid. And it's a very flexible and widely used method. And you don't have to um, be wedded to personal construct psychology in order to use it. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to be um, using an example for our exercise that demonstrates that you can, you can use this method really in, in virtually any field of inquiry without um, importing um, any sort of need to, to think about um, a, a psychology at all. Okay, so what a repertory grid enables you to do then is to examine a person's unique pattern of constructs, so the kinds of constructs that they use when thinking about a particular area. That's what Kelly referred to as individuality. It's the, the extent to which a person's constructs are personal to them and not the same as constructs used by other people. They're individual to you. It enables us to examine the relationships between constructs, to see if they hang together in some way, to see if ha using one construct seems to imply using another construct at the same time. So do they band together in little constellations of constructs? It enables you to examine the relationships between objects or events for the person. We'll come to, to that later when we look at the example. And it, it allows you also to possibly examine shared construing. So just as we've got um, a list here of the constructs that, or some of the constructs that this group of people use when thinking about these three um, issues, we can see that there's some similarity, there's some overlap, some what Kelly called commonality between you in the kinds of constructs that you use. So there's an issue about caring here uh, in Bad Fathers. There's an, uh, an issue here about um, service um, in good hotels. And there's an issue here about um, the use of fat and, and, and sugar in diets. So there's some overlap between you. And that's what he called commonality. Now what I'm passing out to here is a blank grid. So a grid is a you know, um, vertical by horizontal division of space. So we're going to be working vertically and horizontally. Hopefully um, there'll be time to do um, two parts to this exercise. We'll see how we go. But I think giving you a chance to, to have a go at this gives you some insight into um, the possibilities that might life for you in using this kind of method. We're going to be using for this um, exercise, anybody here never eaten a bar of chocolate? Everybody's eaten chocolate, okay. So you've never, never ever eaten chocolate, right, okay. Right, so for those who have eaten chocolate, I want some examples of names of chocolate bars that you have eaten in the past and are reasonably familiar with. It doesn't have to be chocolate bars that you like. In fact, it would be helpful if some of them are ones that you actually don't like and some that you don't mind, as well as some that you do like. So can you shout out their names? Double Decker. Double Decker. <coughs> Mars bar? Did I hear Snickers? Snickers. Snickers. More? Cad Cadbury's? Did you say Cadbury's? Yeah. Is that just Cadbury's plain chocolate, uh, dairy milk chocolate? Cad I'll put Cadbury's dairy milk. Bounty. Bounty. Bounty dark. Bounty dark. <laughs> <laughs> Kit Kat, Kit Kat. Crun crunchy. crunchy, whoops, let's have a couple more, Maltesers, Maltesers. 
peanut M&Ms. Pardon? M A L. Sorry, I didn't. T O S E. Maltos. I've never heard of that. Any more? Does that cover cover everything? What about curly whirlies? Anybody had a curly whirly? Yeah, that's our curly whirly. I don't know how you spell it, never mind. Okay. Pardon? Mini rolls. Oh, is that a chocolate bar? Mini roll. Okay then. Right, let's see how many people, apart from you, who I know has never eaten chocolate. Um, by the way, you deserve a medal for that. <laughs> um, how many people have never had a double decker? You've never had, quite a few people never had. Who's never had a galaxy? One person. Oh, turn it off, please. Who's never had a Mars bar? Okay, everybody's had a Mars bar. Anybody never had a Snickers? Okay. Anybody never had Cadbury's Dairy Milk? Okay. Anybody never had a Bounty Dark Chocolate? What about da Bounty Milk Chocolate? Everybody's had one of those? We're going to have to change that, I'm afraid. It's going to have to be a, a Bounty Milk. Okay. Um, anybody never had a Kit Kat? Okay. Never had a Crunchy? Never had Maltesers? Never had Peanut M&M's? Never had Maltos. Right, look, we're going to have to try that. <laughs> Never had a Curly Whirly. Never had a Mini Roll. Okay. One, two, three, four. Um, okay. I think that might just be enough. Right. We're going to go with those four then. Mars Bar, Snickers, Cadbury's Dairy Milk and Bounty. Milk variety. <clears throat> and we're going to imagine that a chocolate bar manufacturer has engaged you as a researcher to try to find out about what people like in a chocolate bar because they want to launch a new chocolate bar and they want to make sure that it ticks all the boxes, that it's one that everybody's going to rush out and buy. So your job is to find out what it is about the chocolate bars that people like that they can reproduce in their new chocolate bar. Okay. So the first thing that we do then is to list a range of chocolate bars that people have eaten. Um, and we've got four there. And these form what um, Kelly called the elements of the repertory grid. <clears throat> so the first stage of conducting a repertory grid is to do what's called a roll repertory test. And the first stage is to think of a number of elements. Well, we've done that. And then the next stage is to elicit your constructs to allow those to emerge using groups of these elements, using what are called triads, that's groups of three, or dyads, which groups of two. So in order to do this, I've got some cards here. Again, if, Graham, you could just pass these out. Now, you want to be working in pairs for this. So let's see, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So can you get into pairs? And we need, um, we need five cards per pair. So every, every pair should take five cards. Okay. Okay, have we really got five cards per pair? We, on each of those cards, you need to write one of the names of these chocolate bars. So one for Mars bar, one for Snickers, one for Cadbury's Dairy Milk, one for Bounty Milk. Okay, so just write the name on card each per, um, per chocolate bar. And on the fifth card, I want you to write my ideal bar. Okay. 
means you know your imaginary chocolate bar that would you know that would satisfy all your all your tick boxes tick all the boxes for you okay okay everybody written down those got you've got five cards each with a different bar on it and one of them is my ideal bar okay now you're going to be working in pairs it's possible to do this uh, individually on your own but it's actually um, more productive to do it in pairs because you're kind of kind of working as co-therapists or co-counselors if you like this is um, you know PCP arose out of a clinical context out of helping people with personal problems um, and I think what's what's demonstrated by that is how how useful it can be to have another person quizzing you about your thinking it enables you to articulate and to think about it and reflect upon it a little bit more productively than if you were just doing it on your own so I need you to take turns at being the one who is questioned and at being the one who um, is the is the questioner now probably the best way of doing that is to, for the one person to take a turn at being the questioner and then the other person after that that um, after that person's exercise is finished swap roles and do it the other way round okay I shall come, come around and speak to you in a moment about what what you should be doing okay so the idea is to use these cards to help the person to reflect upon what their, their constructs are so you've got five cards and I want you to first of all try picking out any three at random pick out any three out of it's not like a card game you know pick any three pick any three so just take three cards out of out of your pack and place these in front of your partner okay and the question you need to put to them each time is tell me a way in which any two of these are similar and different from the other one okay doesn't matter which two is different from the other the third tell me any way in which two of these are similar and different from the third Okay, just do that now. Just just start off by, by asking that question to your partner. Anybody, anybody not got any sort of answer out of their partner for that? You've got some answer. Okay, so you've presented shh, you've presented three chocolate bars, one of which might have been my ideal bar, um, to your partner, and asked for a way in which any two are similar and different from the third. That question is actually George Kelly's definition of a construct. A construct is any way in which two things are similar and different from a third. Okay? So, you know, in any, in any three people, we could say, okay, two of these are young people, one is an older person. Young versus older is a construct. So what you've done is the, to begin the process of eliciting constructs from your partner about how they think about chocolate. So you want to start filling in the grid for them so get your grid out and on the left hand side we've got um, what we call the preferred pole and on the right hand side the contrast pole so the first thing you have to do is to say okay like we did with fathers and hotels and diets say okay what's the opposite or what's the contrast for you can anybody give me um, just just tell me what their partner has said about the, the similarity between pardon nuts. has one nuts. Has nuts one has nuts so okay. nuts, one has nuts so the next question to your partner is okay as opposed to the other one which what doesn't have nuts okay so in your case has nuts versus doesn't have nuts is a construct it's one dimension um, that you might use in thinking about chocolate bars and in this instance you would need to your your the person who's questioning you would need to ask, well, which do you prefer then? Do you prefer a chocolate bar that has nuts or one that doesn't have nuts? And what would you say to that? Uh, that doesn't have nuts is preferred. So you would write the construct in your grid in this way. On the first row, okay, we're filling in row by row. The first row on the left-hand side, you would put doesn't have nuts. And then at the other end here, where we've got the contrast or non-preferred pole, has nuts. So that's the first construct that you have elicited for your partner on chocolate bars. Okay? So 
The next thing you would do then is to shuffle the cards again and come up with a different three and go through exactly the same process again. Tell me a way in which any two of these are similar and different from the third. Come up with one end of the construct, then you say, yes, okay, as opposed to what? What would be the contrast or the opposite of a, a chocolate bar that, whatever. Then you, when you've got the contrast term, the third question is, and which would you prefer? Okay, which end of the construct, which pole of the construct is preferable to use? And you write it in the next row down, that end of the construct versus that end of the construct, so that you'll end up with, keep doing that as many times as you feel, shh, listen please, keep doing that as many times as you need to do in order to, as it were, plumb the depths of your partner's um, thinking about chocolate. Okay, now I'm going to come around in a moment to make sure that you've understood what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to fill in um, the first part of the grid here. Okay, so you're doing it for your partner first and then when you've got all your constructs filled in, you swap over, start with a new blank grid and your partner will interview you about your chocolate choices. Okay, so off you go, start that and we'll have a little break shortly. What you've probably um, realised is that, that, you know, it sounds a simple exercise, but it, it actually isn't all that easy to do. It can be a di bit difficult to work your way around the grid and where you put this and where you put that and how you use the cards and so on. And that's just a matter of familiarity and getting used to it. But also, I think when you're asked about, you know, to make these comparisons and, you know, what's the, how are two similar and different from the third, sometimes it can be quite hard to articulate your your you know, your ideas. And that's part of the power of the method, really, that, you know, it really does kind of reach to, into parts of people's thinking and their, uh, their meaning systems that straightforward interviewing sometimes can't get to. So making that sort of comparison really gets you thinking about, you know, what's important to you and what the meaning of, of these comparisons are. Um, now, we started off to this exercise by saying this might be a, a market research project. So if you were doing a market research project, the aim would be not to find out what one individual thinks, but what a range of people think, what your target population of chocolate eaters might think about, um, about their chocolate bars. So what we're going to do now is c continue with that idea. And in order to... Um, to complete this little bit of market research, what we need to do is to find out what kinds of constructs the people in this room um, have been using. So let's assume that this is the target population of our chocolate manufacturer, and they're interested in what everybody in this room thinks about chocolate, what they like and what they don't like. So we need to find out uh, what constructs um, you are using. So again, could you shout out either from your grid or from your partner's grid, um, one or two of the constructs that they have come up with. I know that something about nuts was quite commonplace. Yeah. So, shall we have peanuts? Pardon? Doesn't have peanuts. No peanuts versus has peanuts. Has peanuts. Okay. More constructs. Crunchy. Pardon? Crunchy. 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 Sorry, beg your pardon. Crunchy as opposed to a bar which smooth. is smooth. More? High quality chocolate. High quality chocolate as opposed to acceptable chocolate. Acceptable chocolate. <laughs> there is no unacceptable chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> What's the definition of high quality? High quality. Bon Pardon? Bon Bon Bonti. 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 Okay. 
of what sugar? High concentration of sugar. High, right, high put concentration, concentration of sugar, sugar as opposed to? A pinch of salt. Salty taste. A, a, a salty a pinch taste. Of taste. A pinch of salt, yeah. A, a pinch of salt. Yeah. Okay. There's another one you were going to give me here. Raisins, with raisins. With raisins. Mm -hmm. As opposed to? Without. Without. Has anybody got, um, does anybody want to contribute one that they think is similar to any of these, but not exactly the same? Anyone got, got one about nuts? Yeah? yeah. So, so we have chewy as well, chewy? Chew all right, then chewy as opposed to non chewy. We got a single piece as opposed to bars and more pieces. In a bar, so, so a bar that has one, piece of, one single piece of chocolate as opposed to two, two or more bars. One piece, more than one. Okay. Now, what, what, what I'm looking for is whether, <coughs> whether people have come up with constructs, some of which look a bit similar to these. Yes? Yeah. So caramel, so that's similar to chewy. OK, so with caramel... Is that sort of making Without yeah. caramel. Yeah. And we've got with biscuits, which are similar to crunchy. Oh, crunchy, yeah. With biscuit... Yeah, as opposed to without. Okay. More chocolate covering. Pardon? More chocolate covering. More chocolate covering. Covering, yeah. Um, that's brown too. More chocolate as opposed to. What was the opposite? Thin covering. Thin covering. We had a variation on a single bar being sectioned, not under the Mental Health Act. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, one so piece or one section. Piece section. One piece or section. Okay. Right. Okay. <clears throat> um, the idea here is that if you were a market researcher, or if you were the researcher doing this piece of, 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 uh, of research, you'd be trying to do some sort of content analysis of these constructs to come up with a, a short list that would be meaningful to everybody. Okay, so we could say, well, you know, chewy versus non-chewy perhaps incorporates with caramel, caramel without caramel. And perhaps, um, you know, one piece and more than one piece includes one piece versus section. Um, and perhaps um, with biscuit and without biscuit, uh, uh, is incorporated in crunchy versus smooth. You might even say that there's some, maybe, maybe there's a case for saying there's an overarching construct here of chocolate that has something in it, some other ingredient, whether it's peanuts, biscuits or raisins, as opposed to one without anything else in it. So there'd be some decision to make about um, how to come up with a, a short list of constructs that would be meaningful to most people who have supplied their own individual ones. So, would it be true to say, does the idea of cr something that's crunchy versus something that's smooth, is that a, a construct that makes sense to people in the room? That there's chocolate bars that have something you can crunch on, and other chocolate bars are just smooth chocolate. Yes, yeah? so that's, that makes sense to everybody. Okay. Um, what about um, this chewy versus non-chewy? Something that you know has has a lot of substance to it that you have to chew on. Yeah. Uh, something that's that's not very chewy. Does that make that makes sense to everybody? Are there other constructs here that that you feel you know um, even though they're not constructs you came up with that make sense to you? That think yes, I can understand chocolate in those terms. Any that you could pick out that think, yes, I understand, you know, one that's um, in just in one piece rather than section, sections, or does that, that make sense? One whole piece of chocolate rather than one that's in various bits? Okay. 
Um, okay. Uh, have we got other? What was that one? Light versus heavy. Okay. Light versus heavy. Chunky versus non-chunky. I would think of chocolates in terms of children's chocolate as well. Adults, oh, children's chocolate. Yeah, yeah. You know, if I was choosing like children's. Mm. So is that it? That's something that would house all the chocolates. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Any more? Any more constructs you want to put in here that you feel are not covered by what's here? Mm. Pardon? Colourful packaging versus just brown. Brown. Yeah, Brad, did you say brown? Yeah. Colourful packaging. Versus brown. You haven't got what? Was that a construct that you came up with? Yeah. So milk versus dark. Okay. What I'm going to do is go through these quickly. Just put your hand up if it's a construct that makes no sense to you, that you think you could not apply to chocolate bars, okay? So we're going to go through them quickly. Um, no peanuts or has peanuts. Anybody can't make sense of that? Crunchy versus smooth. I think we agreed everyone can, um, can use that. High quality chocolate versus acceptable chocolate. That doesn't make sense to you, okay? We'll take that one out. Milky taste versus sugary taste. Several people don't make sense of that. High concentration of sugar versus a pinch of salt. That's obviously a very idiosyncratic one. With raisins, without raisins. Okay? With caramel, without caramel. Chewy versus non-chewy. One piece versus more than one piece, or sectioned. More chocolate, a thick covering of chocolate versus, thin, versus a thin covering of chocolate. Doesn't make, you, you can't understand that. Mm -hmm. So, right, I'm okay, not surprised at that, but we'll check it out. Not saying whether, whether it's one that's important to you, but it's one that you can't, just can't understand. <coughs> okay. Light versus heavy. Okay. Chunky versus non-chunky. Children's chocolate versus adults' chocolate. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Colourful versus brown. Doesn't make sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. And milk chocolate versus dark chocolate. Okay. We're going to work with those constructs then. Because these seem to be ones that everybody that is are to some degree meaningful to everybody in the room. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. Or oh, did we put with biscuit? Did I say with biscuit without biscuit? Yeah, it's, yeah. Still it's still there. Yes. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven constructs. So what I want you to do is to get your other grid out now. Okay. Your fresh grid. Okay, and I want you to, in these spaces up the top here, just use five of them, and the tops of the columns, to write the names of the chocolate bars that you've been working with. So that's Bounty, Mars, Snickers, um, Cadbury's Dairy Milk, and My Ideal Bar. So in each of those five spaces, one, two, three, four, five. There are actually seven spaces there, so you're only going to use the first five. Put the names of each of those chocolate bars. Okay, has everybody done that? So you should have one in each of these top tops of the rows. Then down the sides, I want you to put these, these constructs. So the first row then. Are you with me? Are you are you are you okay? In the first row then you can put no doesn't matter about preferred and non preferred for this exercise. Don't worry about which side you put them on. But no peanuts versus has peanuts. Crunchy versus smooth. 
with biscuit versus without biscuit. So just write the constructs in, one pole on each side of the row, and you'll need 11 rows to do that. And if you can't read my writing, that's no peanuts versus has peanuts, crunchy versus smooth, with biscuit versus without biscuit, with raisins versus without raisins, with caramel versus without caramel, chewy versus non-chewy, one piece versus more than one piece, light versus heavy, chunky versus non-chunky, children's versus adults, and milk versus dark. So you should have no peanuts in this space here and with peanuts in this space here and then crunchy in this space here and smooth in this space here. Okay, so just go down your grid, putting in the constructs. Okay, when you've got all the chocolate bars listed across the top and all the constructs listed down the left hand and right hand sides, then you can move on to the process of actually completing the grid or scoring the elements. And again, you should do this in partnership with the other person. You should be taking charge of their grid and saying to them, taking each row in turn, each construct in turn, you put an, a, a naught or a cross in the box in that row to represent which pole of the construct each element lies at for you. So if you have, in the first row, you should have no peanuts versus has peanuts, you go across each box in turn. So let's say you have in this row, let's say you've got um, Mars bar in that row. Okay. So you'd have no peanuts versus has peanuts. Naught for this end, cross for that end. So you'd be saying, in this box, put a naught or a cross, depending on whether the Mars bar feels to you like it has peanuts or no peanuts. Okay? If it has no peanuts, it gets, it gets a naught because it's at this end. If it has peanuts, it gets a cross because a cross is at that end. You put a naught or a cross, in each of the boxes, depending upon which end of the construct each of those elements represents for you. So when it comes to something like, um, let's say crunchy versus smooth will be down here, and you'll come to bounty. Is a bounty crunchy or smooth? Which, which end of the construct does it tend towards? Does it tend to be rather smooth or tend to be a bit crunchy? And you would put a knot or a cross in that box, depending on which end of the construct it seems to occupy for you. Okay? And do, do you do each other's? You do each other's, yes. So you question each other and you say, you know, you go through each construct in turn, so go down each row in turn for each of the elements, and you'd be saying to your partner, okay, tell me then, a bounty bar, peanuts or no peanuts? Naught or across, and you put a naught or across in the bounty column, depending on which end of the construct that person feels it lies at. Then you say, okay, Mars bar, peanuts or no peanuts, naught or across, and you fill in the grid for your partner, depending on whether they say a naught or across for each element. And I'll come round and help you with that. Okay, see how you get on. I think you all got the, the right idea in the end about how you should be doing it. Some of you haven't, haven't quite understood which um, elements to put at the tops of your columns. You should have had five elements that were all the same as everybody else's. So you should have had the five that we were working with um, in the earlier part of the exercise. So you'll just have to imagine that you did do that, that we've got a room full of people who have all been scoring the same chocolate bars on the same constructs. So what you've ended up with is a kind of survey what we've done is, through the first part of the exercise, 
We've looked at the dimensions of, of meaning that are relevant to people in this population, in this room. And we've come up with a list here that are meaningful to you all, that, that, that seem like meaningful dimensions along which to rate any chocolate bar. And we've taken a variety of chocolate bars and you've all rated them. You've given them a naught or a cross on each of these um, dimensions. <coughs> If we were going to continue with this market research um, example, um, what we would do is turn these into preferred and non-preferred polls. I asked you not to bother doing that because it was just too complicated, but we could end up turning them around and saying, okay, let's have all the, the preferred ones on the left and all the non-preferred ones on the right. And we could then enter all that data into a computer program that would calculate just how important each of these dimensions are for the people in this room. Is it important to have a chocolate bar that's crunchy rather than smooth? Is it important to have one um, that's light rather than heavy or that has one piece rather than two pieces or the other way around? So you've, you've, you would all have expressed a preference on the same dimensions that are meaningful to everybody in this community of chocolate eaters. And the computer programme would be able to work out um, <coughs> just how important each of these dimensions are for you. And then we can present that material to our chocolate manufacturer and say, this new chocolate bar has to be crunchy rather than smooth. It has to have peanuts in it rather than no peanuts or no peanuts. It has to have biscuits rather than peanuts. It has to have more than one piece rather than just one piece. It has to be chunky rather than not chunky. You know, go away and make one just like that and everybody here will like it. So that's how you would use a construct, um, a, a grid method, to, um, to investigate a, um, a market research or any, any other research question where you're interested in the commonality between people in a community that, uh, that share some experience. But as I mentioned at the outset, the technique arose really because of its particular interest in individuals um, construing in how an individual person makes sense of the world, word, of the world. <clears throat> and so you can uh, use this method in any sort of case study approach or as I said before in a preparatory um, research stage where you're trying to work out what kinds of dimensions of meaning are important to people. So just to finish off with, what I've got here is a grid that I filled in using um, some of the same chocolate bars that you chose, but these were obviously choc chocolate bars that I was familiar with. It doesn't matter which they are. The elements in a grid are, in the end, not that important. They're just a way of eliciting the constructs. It's the constructs that we're after. So how we get to those doesn't matter. The fact that I've used Bounty and Snickers and Kit Kat doesn't matter. It's the constructs that they've enabled me to come up with by comparing those, just as you did. And what we can do finally now is to look for some relationships between um, the constructs and between the elements to try to get some understanding of what it is about chocolate bars that really um, interests me, what's meaningful for me, what I like. So here are my preferred poles down the left-hand side and my non-preferred poles down the right-hand side and how I've rated those chocolate bars on all of those constructs. So first of all, what I want you to do is to look for relationships between elements. This is one of the things I said we can do with, um, with a grid. We can look at relationships between elements. And one way we can do that is to look down the rows, down the element columns, sorry, down the columns, look at vertically down the columns and look for patterns of scores that are the same or similar. So can you find patterns of, of scores that look the same or similar? Yeah, Snickers and Ideal. Snickers and Ideal, okay. So what that tells you is that the, whatever the Snickers bar is like, it's pretty ideal from my point of view. It has everything I like in it. So that gives you a clue about what I like in chocolate bars. Can you find a column that's exactly the opposite of that pattern of construing? Milky Way. 
So that gives you extra information. It says, what I like is exactly like Snickers and exactly not like Milky Way. Okay? So that begins to give you some idea of what my chocolate preferences are about. Then you can have a look at relationships between constructs. So this is one of the other things that we said that grids can enable you to do. So instead of looking down the columns this time, we look across the rows. Can you see any patterns of scores that look the same or similar looking across the rows? Chewy and solid. They are identical. I've scored them in the same way. And from that, you begin, can begin to say, OK, there's a little constellation of constructs here. Um, also, satisfying. They're all scored in the same way. OK, so that pattern of noughts and crosses across those rows is the same. And that begins to tell you that satisfying versus leaving you still hungry chewy versus not chewy, solid versus insubstantial. A part of a similar kind of idea for me. So I'm, I'm interested in a chocolate bar that's chewy and solid and leaves you feeling satisfied rather than one that seems insubstantial and hasn't got anything to bite on and leaves you still feeling hungry. So those relationships between constructs mean that one construct in construct theory terms, has implications for another construct. One construct implies another. They, they kind of go together. So you can, from reading that grid, you can tell quite a lot about what's important for me in eating chocolate. So you've quite rightly picked out that related elements are Snickers, uh, my ideal bar, and Milky Way. And related constructs are satisfying, still hungry, and chewy, not chewy, but also, let's go, just go back. <coughs> was it has, what was it? Has bits and smooth versus hard and soft. Let's just look at that. Has bits versus smooth and hard versus soft. They're not identical, but they're pretty similar in terms of the patterns. So again, you can begin to say that, you know, I like things chocolate that, that is quite hard, something to bite on, has things in it like peanuts or bits of biscuit or whatever, versus one that's just soft and smooth. Okay, So this, these two constructs have implications for each other. They seem yeah. to be related, as do these three. Um, so that's, that's kind of how you, one of the ways in which you might interpret a repertory grid when you're working with an individual person, Look, just looking for relationships like that. And quite often you can use a grid of this kind as the basis for an interview and say, okay, let's just inspect this grid together and see, you know, it seems to be, you know, that you like things that are satisfying and chewy and solid rather than things that are not chewy and insubstantial. Can you tell me a bit more about that? What's that about? So you can actually use it as the basis of, of finding more in-depth information from the person. And although I've only used you know, a fairly trivial example here by using chocolate bars. We could have used any material, we could have used people here, which would give it a bit more of a <coughs> significant um, meaning. So rather than it being chocolate bars ac across the top, those elements might have been the mother, my father, my best friend, um, somebody I hated at school, you know, somebody I admired, and generate you know, you generate different kinds of constructs with those elements, but then looking for relationships between elements and constructs when it's people that we're talking about would obviously tell you an awful lot about the person that you're investigating. Okay, we've just got a couple of minutes for any questions, if you have any. I know it's been quite a tough thing for some of you to do. It's, you know, not, not easy to get to grips with. Anything that uh, you're not, not sure about? They look good them as well, even if you go to Thornton's and look at the counter, they will go for the ones that are pink and heart shaped mm -hmm. and wrapped Colour. in foil and yes. then, then I would go for maybe something yes. different. But it is, it, it is what you see. Yeah. It is, it's what you see in it and, and it's true that some of these constructs don't apply to some of the um, to some of the, the elements. So for example, no peanuts versus has peanuts, you know, it's not something that 
a p really, or, or um, let's just say, just thinking, um, sometimes you, you come to, to try to rate an element on a construct and you think, I just, I just can't, it doesn't make any sense to do that. Sometimes a construct, um, an element is what they call out of the range of convenience for a construct. You just have to leave that, it doesn't matter. This method is not one where you're necessarily going to be um, using a statistical pa package to look at the, the findings. Um, and it doesn't matter if there are missing values sometimes. You know, the point is, what, how can you use it to, to explore the meaningfulness of the person's social world? So if a construct makes no sense to them or can't be applied to a particular <coughs> element, it doesn't matter, just go on to the next one. You know, build up the picture in whichever way you can with your, with your participant. <coughs> okay. Well, I hope you find that at least um, as interesting as you found it challenging. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I hope that it, t it will you know, <coughs> begin to make some sense to you as you, uh, as you take your grids home with you and look at them and see what sense you can read into your own grid now and interrogate yourself. You know, see, say, you know, what does this tell me about my own tastes in chocolate? I know it's only, as I say, a trivial example, but the exercise should be, um, you know, it should be interesting for you. Okay. Yeah. Yes. 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 It can be a very useful method, actually, with um, with young people, because, you know, rather than interviewing young people, which can be very difficult for them to articulate how they feel about things, saying, you know, okay, here's some things to compare. <coughs> Compare that one with that one. What's the difference or the similarity between them? Is easier to do, you know. So that can, can be one way of, of accessing um, your children's experience or, or the experience of any anybody who finds it hard to articulate how they feel about it. <coughs> okay, we better go because I can hear a class waiting to come in. So thank you.